Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. But don't try to serve him from that motive of get, 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 get. I don't care if you have to take a year or five or ten. Take some time and fall in love with Jesus. If we just fall in love with Jesus. And sadly, religion doesn't always teach us to fall in love with Jesus. It gives us stuff to do. And I may say this in every message that I preach from now till Jesus comes back, but he didn't die so we could have a religion. When somebody asks you if you're a Christian, please don't tell them what religion you are. I don't know if you've figured it out, but in heaven there's not going to be a Catholic section and a Lutheran section and a Methodist section and a Baptist section. And we poor, crazy Pentecostals are not going to be out in the back lot somewhere either. There's not going to be a wild uh, a section for the wild people. <laughs> oh God, I don't think I'll get this done tonight, but. said and I will give you rest I will ease relieve and refresh your souls take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm humble gentle meek and lowly I am not harsh hard sharp and pressing God is not hard to get along with <laughs> yes God has a high standard for our lives but let me tell you something As long as you love him with your whole heart and you're making an effort every day through the power of the Holy Ghost to make progress, God not only sees where you're at, he sees where you'll end up. And you need to stop not enjoying where you're at on the way to where you're going. I want you to start enjoying yourself right now because God enjoys you in your imperfect state. I think some of the things about us that we get all rattled about, God probably thinks they're funny. <laughs> How many of you know that sometimes the, maybe you're married to somebody and in the beginning some of the things they do just irritate the living daylights out of you, but then, <laughs> you know, after about 30, 40 years, you just think it's funny. <laughs> hey, anybody been married long enough to know what I'm talking about? Come on. It's just like, it's funny, you know? like. Dave has a pretty good sized face between his two front teeth. <laughs> It's an imperfection. And he said to me a few years ago, I, maybe I'll get that fixed. I said, no, I don't want you to do that. He said, why? I said, because that's you. <laughs> But that was a good lesson to me to realize that sometimes I think, you know, God's not all that worried about the spaces in our spiritual <laughs> perfection. Now, I don't mean that, you know, we need to live sloppy lives and not care about sin. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. But I'm talking about some of the stuff that we stress over. Okay, so you lose your temper once in a while. Repent. Ask God to forgive you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Learn from your mistake. Go on about your business. Study in that area. Ask God to help you change. But see, the thing is, is guilt is just a treadmill that just wears you out. And it's going so fast, you just can't get off of it. I spent so many years feeling guilty. And here now, I've already been called into ministry. And I've got some home Bible studies. And God's trying to prepare me for ministry. And I didn't get to go to Bible college, but I went to the school of the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you something. 
It was like a quick, fast, forward course. And one day I'd done something wrong and I was feeling guilty and I was out shopping. I had my sack of guilt with me because I took it everywhere I went. It was this invisible burden that I carried around with me. And for some reason, I remember this real clearly. I had gone to Walmart and I parked way out in the back of the parking lot where no cars were. It certainly wasn't because I didn't want my car to get hit. It was 20 years old. <laughs> but I just was feeling so bad. And I just wanted to have a lonely, pitiful <laughs> walk. Come on. Just, oh God, I'm so bad. I'm just, oh God, I'm so bad. I, I'm a mess. Nobody messes up like I do. God, I don't know how you're going to use me. My God, will I ever change? I don't think I'll ever change. Maybe some of you could do God a favor and leave your sack here tonight. And the Holy Ghost began to speak in my heart and he said, um, Joyce, how do you plan to get over this sin? What, what are you going to do about it? I mean, I had a Bible study. I knew the answer. I said, well, I'm just going to receive the sacrifice that Jesus made for me when he died on Calvary. <laughs> Spiritual. <laughs> yes, Lord. I put on my religious Pharisee cloak. And... But now listen, then this came up in my heart. Uh, I see, and when did you plan to do that? And here came a revelation because I thought, probably in about three days. <laughs> and then I realized I had done something wrong and God's forgiveness was right there for me all the time, but I was going to feel miserable for three days and beat on myself to pay for my sin when Jesus had already paid. And I can tell you it is like a slap in his face when we do that because the price he paid can only be received. It's a gift of grace and a gift of mercy and a gift of God's love. And this is what came to my heart. Joyce, if you don't mind, if it's not too much trouble, <laughs> would it be okay if you just went ahead and received that forgiveness today? Because I have some things I need you for and frankly in this condition, you are no good to me. <laughs> Come on, somebody give God praise tonight. Now, I am not giving you a license to live a sloppy life. That's not what this is about. That's not at all what this is about. But I'm trying to tell you that you may have a beautiful, wonderful heart, but if you're going about it the wrong way, <laughs> you're never going to get the result that you want. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For it's by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you're saved delivered from judgment and made a partaker of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God. Now, not because of works. Come on, you can, you can, you, your attention span is this long, I believe it. Not because of works, not because of the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast, it is not the result of what anybody can possibly do. So no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. Now, until you understand eight and nine, you cannot go to verse 10. And a lot of people try to fast forward through eight and nine and they try to do 10, but their motive's not right. Once you receive Christ as a free gift, and you receive that love as a free gift. And you know that there's nothing that you can do to get God to love you. God, love is not something God does. It's who he is. God is love. He just can't help himself. He doesn't love us because we deserve it. It's just what he is. When we receive that wonderful gift of salvation, 
not by anything that we've done. It's not based on my church attendance. It's not based on how much money I give in the offering. It's not based on how much of the Bible I read. It's not, it's not based on anything. I just come and say, I'm a mess. I'm a sinner. I need you, God. If you don't help me, there is no help for me. But interestingly enough, that needs to be the same prayer we pray every morning. God, if you don't help me today, there is no help for me. There is no way that I can go out there and keep myself straight and do what needs to be done and represent you properly and love people and walk in the fruit of the Spirit if you don't help me. God, help me, help me, help me. Now, verse 10. For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship. Now we've had this miracle. We've been recreated in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Recreated in Christ Jesus. Born anew. Why? That we may do those good works which God predestined and planned beforehand for us, taking paths which He prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us to live. Now, I know that's a lot, but let me try to explain this to you. You receive Christ totally as a free gift, not because of your works, not because of any effort that you do. God has already laid out all these good works He wants us to do before we ever showed up on planet Earth. But before we can do them with any kind of a right attitude, we've got to not be doing them to get what we've already received by faith in verses 8 and 9. We've already got the best that God has to give. God is not for sale. We can't buy Him. When I see what wonderful things He's done for me, and I remind myself on a daily basis, remembering what God has done for me, remembering where I came from, I fall more deeply and deeply in love with him every day, and I can't help myself. I just have to find somebody to be good to. Now, I'm telling you the truth. When I spend time with God in the morning and I think about how much he loves me and how good he is to me, and I think about how I don't deserve it, it just makes me want to go out and just gush all over somebody. But when I used to have all my rules and regulations and I had my plan, I was going to read the Bible through every year and I was going to do this. And I'm not saying that's bad. Have a regular Bible reading plan. But I, I was, my motive wasn't even right. You know, it's interesting when your motive is wrong how God won't help you do something. And my motive wasn't right. I wasn't trying to read the Bible through in a year because I really wanted to know what was in it. We had a program in our church to read the Bible through in a year. And everybody got a, little, got a little calendar. And every week the pastor said, now how many of you caught up with your Bible reading? And I didn't want to not be able to lift my hand. Because after all, I was in leadership and I sat on the front row. And I had a seat with my name on it and I had my own parking place. You see, I was important in the church. So if anybody should read the Bible through in a year and not get behind, it should be me. Well, I put the calendar up on my refrigerator, and as long as I was getting my check marks, I was proud. I'd walk by there and swell a little bit. You had to read six chapters a day so you didn't get behind, and I'd read six. And didn't remember nothing. Didn't get nothing. <laughs> didn't mean a thing to me, but I got a check mark that day. Come on, I hope somebody's in the house today. And then about the same time, we had an intercessor that came to our church, and she gave her testimony about how she got up every morning, started praying at five, and prayed till nine. And I tell you what, that woman had the power of God all over her. When she opened her mouth, you could sense the power of God. I thought, I'm doing that. <laughs> so now I was really in trouble. I had my Read Your Bible Through It A Year program. I had my calendar. Now I'm starting to get gaping holes on my calendar because I had days where I just couldn't read the six chapters. And then I, I was about 36 chapters behind and I'm trying to pray four hours every morning. <laughs> my gosh, I was an exhausted Christian. <laughs> God, I am so tired of this. I don't understand, God, what is wrong in my life. I go to church every Sunday. I'm trying to do everything everybody tells me to do. And I just don't have any peace. And I just don't have any joy. I just don't understand what's wrong with me. Come on.
Well, I pray now. <laughs> Probably a lot more than four hours a day, but I don't do it with a clock locked up in a room. <laughs> and I'm not even saying it's bad to start with that kind of discipline. Every morning I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do this. But you got to make sure your motive's right. You can't be doing it to get something from God. And I can tell you one of the ways you can tell when your motive is wrong. When you have a problem in your life and you hear come out of your mouth, God, I don't understand how this could happen to me after all I've done for you. Well, you know, God, I go to church and I give and I serve and I'm good to people and I read the Bible and I pray. And how could this happen to me? Well, that's a clue right there that you've been doing it for the wrong reason. Oh, I'd like to run out there and just grab you and shake you. It's a subtle shift, but it's a motive change. It's another little version of what I shared with you this morning. Don't get in a marriage relationship so that other person can make you happy. Don't get into anything to get. Always get into everything to give. And initially, you may come into a relationship with Christ because he's got a lot you need. But don't try to serve him from that motive of get, 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 get. I don't care if you have to take a year or five or ten. Take some time and fall in love with Jesus. And the way you're going to do that is by studying and meditating on what he has already done for you in Christ. What he's done for you. Oh, we're good at receiving from the devil. We easily receive condemnation, fear, lies, threats, negative feelings about our abilities, negative thoughts about ourselves. Come on, devil, pour it on. Shame, discouragement, depression, despondency. Nobody loves me. Woe is me. I've lost my joy. I have no peace. I don't know who I am in Christ. We got everything the devil wants to give us. Unless you come to the kingdom like a little child. They didn't refuse to take my money. Let me tell you something. If a kid gets in trouble, they're outside playing and they get in trouble, and mama calls them in to correct them, and they go through their boo-hoos, and I'm sorry. Mom says, okay, now I love you. Go back out and play. They don't say, oh, no, mother. I'd much rather stay inside and work to make up for what I did. <laughs> Come on. Has any one of your kids ever done that? Ever, ever, ever? I mean, they're out the door. <laughs> they forget the whole thing. Mama loves me. Mama loves me. <laughs> what would you think if the kids said, oh, no, mother? I cannot receive your goodness and your mercy. I must now go and clean my room and I will stay there and clean all day. <laughs> oh. But here's what the Bible says to receive. <laughs> to as many as received him gave he power to become the sons of God. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Ask and receive that your joy might be full. Receive the Word of God with meekness. To as many as received and welcomed Him, gave He power to become the sons of God. Receive forgiveness of your sins. Receive the mercy of God. Receive the love of God. Receive your inheritance. Receive mercy for your failures. Receive the result of your faith. Receive all the good things God has created with thanksgiving. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. Well, why don't you make a decision tonight that you're going to stop receiving from the devil and you're going to start receiving from God. There's some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful scriptures in the book of Romans. And I'd like to take just a moment to show you a couple of them. Romans 
chapter 3, 23 and 24. I think I got about a four-part message up here tonight, and I'm trying to figure out how to get out of it. <laughs> I'm trying to land the plane. <laughs> you know, that's what preachers do. They try to land, then they circle the airport one more time. <laughs> well, in closing, <laughs> and then we start all over again. Romans 3, 23 and 24, since all have sinned and are falling short of the honor and the glory of God. We don't have any trouble receiving that. Yep, yeah, that's me. I'm a sinner. All are justified and made upright and put in right standing with God. Now, I have a hard time receiving that. I can get the sin part, but what is this justified thing? Righteousness thing. Freely, what's that word? And graciously, grace, unmerited, unearned, uh-oh, favor, mercy. <laughs> Verse 24 is the recovery from 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Through one man, Adam, we all received sin and condemnation. Why can we not, through the one God-man, Jesus Christ, receive righteousness and justification and cleansing and mercy and grace? Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Everything that God has is way much better, cooler than anything the enemy has. Freely you have received, freely give. You get somewhere not very long after you get out of bed and you spend a little time with God before you go out and try to deal with people. Now, you know, whether you're a morning person or not, whatever, you know, even if you can only handle five minutes, lock yourself in the bathroom, do something and say, God, I need you today. Lord Jesus, help me. Help me, God. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now, Lord, I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I receive a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. I receive favor today everywhere that I go. Thank you for your grace that helps me in everything that I do. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Do not spend the first 15 minutes of the morning letting the devil give you an inventory of everything you did wrong the day before and how you will surely mess this day up just as bad. So therefore, you might as well pull the covers over your head and not even bother getting up because you are such a pathetic mess. So now tomorrow morning when the devil starts that, you jump up and say, I don't receive that. I don't receive that. But God, I receive from you. I am forgiven. I am a child of God. I am anointed. God loves me. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. Well, God is a giver and he wants to give to you but you need to be willing to receive. We need to learn how to receive from God. We need to not receive what the devil wants to tell us, but always be open to what God wants to do in our life. You know, if we learn how to receive, then God can do all that he wants to do in our lives and he can use us for his glory.